Hey guys, this is Krista from the Moratorium. Do you like grizzly gore and mysteries? Of course you do. That is why I suggest you subscribe to my blog, Suspended Animation, Dormant Stories Waiting to be Told, where we at the Moratorium offer a number of lurid tales from axemen running around New Orleans to phantoms in Texarkana. And if you're feeling especially generous, head over to our Patreon, where for just a couple bucks a month, you can help the moratorium grow. And that would be pretty kick-ass. And remember, long live BHS. Welcome to the Yarn Wall. This week, Jason and I put our balls away and clean up after the Phantasm double feature. Jason takes us down the path to talk about the real reason the Goratorium was created. To talk about movies like the 1978 Faces of Death. I dive down on the amazing career of M. Emmett Walsh. And then we follow the yarn to a star-studded, satanistic, cinematic masterpiece. But you'll have to stick it in your ear holes to find out. Cue the music. And in three, two, one, I already forgot it. We as a giant, or I call the others dead. You think I imagined all of it, don't you? You think I'm insane? That's feng shui. A match made in a bathroom, just floating into the void. I live in a small town with everyone either drives a truck or a motorcycle. Well, deal with it. In the end, deal with it, guys. I have chickens. I have insane neighbors. Yeah, we have chickens, rabbits. My neighbors don't know how to talk to each other. I've talked about this before. I've heard them before on the podcast and tried to drown them out. (laughs) Because I guess I was using too good of microphones. We're just now using the same shitty microphones. That's why we sound so actually good. actually downgraded. Yeah. It's so much better. <laughs> yeah, we have the fancy ones. They're just... It's that rawness that we right. want, you know, that kind of real, you know... I've got my daughter as a boom mic operator behind me, and... How's she doing? She is shaking already. We're three minutes in. <laughs> yeah, that boom mic is heavy. Well, <laughs> it's a workout, Yeah. Yeah. It should be a grown man doing that, but you know, child labor. It's yeah, cheap. It's not like we're making a lot of money. <laughs> Wherever you can cut corners, that would be. Fun. Now, uh, speaking of my neighbors, mm-hmm. though, I came home the other night, and I come up over the hill, and I see what looks like a little girl with long hair in the middle of the road. <laughs> okay, what looks like. Yes, what looks like, what appears to be. Oh, I don't know. I don't like where this is going. (laughs) But I came up over the hill, and I started slowing down immediately, and it wasn't until I got up on it. It's a traffic cone that he has set out there, and he put a wig on top of it. Oh, my God. And he must have sensed my dilemma, the look on my face, or he may have read my lips as I was saying, what (laughs) the fuck? Right. As I was driving by. He decided to follow me to my house, you know, two doors down to to explain. (laughs) To explain. (laughs) (laughs) So you didn't immediately call the police. (laughs) Right. Which I was uh, on the verge. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's not somehow that's weirder than seeing like a dead body or something. Right. Right. It was bizarre. So he comes up to me and tells me that he has (laughs) put this cone out in the road. With this wig on it to slow down some of the crazy ass drivers on my street. I understand. So for once, I kind of agree with him. I'm like, yeah, that's, uh, I guess that'll work. That would be so funny if like, you know, you're like Donald Sutherland and don't look now. And you, you're like kind of creeping up behind the cone <laughs> and then you just like suddenly grab the cone and turn it around and, and it's <laughs> Billy Barty in a wig or whatever that I can't remember. Oh, right. Who played E.T. wearing that little blonde wig? That's what it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what it would have been like. Ugh. E.T. was not a fun creature to look at, I don't think. I was going to bring this up, though. I mean, you saw E.T. in the 80s. You, you probably saw it I, at the theater. Everybody saw it at the theater, wasn't I it? I believe I did, yeah. Yeah, it was the law back then. You had yes. to go see this movie at the theater. Yeah, like Frampton Comes Alive. They just hand them out. <laughs> just hand it out. Did you cry when E.T. died? 
Now, I don't know if that is a... I, I remember... I Okay, I'll take that as a yes. I mean, I... I <sighs> I just don't know if it's a false memory because everyone says that. You know what I yeah. mean? Like now I just have it in my head. I think I did. Although, I don't know. I don't see myself crying. I'm I'm more of a wuss now than I... I mean, for okay. sure more of a wuss now than I was when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Which I'll be getting... I'll, I'll be speaking about that later. Okay. I was, I was waiting for you to speak about it now. No, well, so, I, I, it, 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 we'll, we'll do our thing. Uh, yeah, we'll just say the Gilmore Girls. Damn. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Do you do? Is that a? Uh, is that a show that you just picked a show that was like all girls? Yeah, yeah. And, I, I, well, I assume I've never seen it, so. <laughs> I think it. I mean, I don't know. Two uh, girls that talk fast. I think is what it. What the, oh, okay. Is that the alternate title? Yep, that's the tagline. I was bringing up this E.T. thing because I I thought about, damn, you know, movies do affect us in different ways. Yeah. And I remember crying. I have there's certain movies. I know I've spoken about this before. Certain movies that still I hold very close to myself. And there's a scene in those movies that will get me to feel uh, the same emotion that Mm -hmm. I get from the first time watching it. Okay. And I get that from just a few movies. But. I mean, I'll get chills, you know, I'll get a little choked up. Sure. One movie in particular would have been The Abyss. Hmm. Okay. When Ed Harris is trying to save her and all I need is a goddamn crescent wrench, that scene. Yeah. Yeah. Makes me well up every time when he sure. pulls her when out he- of the water and the pressure probably would have crushed her body entirely, you know, by the time he got her over to whatever. And sure. They started doing compressions. And mm-hmm. when he's screaming at her, you know, you never backed away from anything in your life. So he's like fight. slaps her too. Oh yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's, well, I guess in that circumstance, you probably would yeah. want to slap uh, her around a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> this might be my only chance. <laughs> exactly. It's not just because she's possibly drowned. It's there's yes. more to it than that. That scene usually gets me gets me a little worked mm-hmm. up. Sure. So you can see that. Are, is there a movie like that in your repertoire that? As the years go on, I, I am more sensitive for sure. I, I will cry at, at certain movies. I can't think of the last one that I did. I mean, like horror movies. You know what I mean? <laughs> like King of the Hill made me kind of well up Ooh. the other day. <laughs> well, a lot of those episodes, if you're into the King of the Hill, they do, you know, they kind of have lessons in them and, and, uh, I don't know. They're, I mean, I think some of them are, uh, very touching, but, uh, yeah, it's a cartoon. Okay. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's still a cartoon. Yes. 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 They haven't made it into a live action movie yet. Animal <laughs> stuff really gets to me too. I can't. I can't do yeah? like animal cruelty or just like any uh, Sarah McLachlan. You know, mm. save our pets oh, video. God. Just a commercial that makes you well up. What is that? The uh, Humane Society or the sure. NAA? Whatever. And the ACP, what? Wait a minute. <laughs> That's a different, I'm thinking of a different thing. Okay. I hate those so much. Especially when they're poorly placed. If you're watching a horror movie and that yeah, comes on, sure. you're like, it really takes you out of the moment. Yeah. Well, and that, you know, like if you're watching like Big Bang Theory or something, you're already like on the edge. And then they show you something like that. And it's just like... <laughs> Honey, I'm going to be right back. I'm just going to take all of these a leave and just see what that does. That's like the strongest thing I can think of. Great. By the way, I, I my wife has, uh, she's been watching Big Bang Theory, I think just for more like background noise. But uh, mm-hmm. have we have we talked about the uh, Big Bang Theory without the uh, canned laughter before? No. Oh, man. It's pretty rough stuff. Like, you realize how much those like cues you know (laughs) like just people laughing okay you need those in a lot of shows because if not you would just be you know because they pause for so long for the laughter you know what i mean like there's a good like you know six second beat where they're just like looking at each other waiting for you know it's amazing how they are uh, manipulating your emotions uh, but you don't even realize it's happening wow so when they're filming this, though, 
Do they have somebody with canned laughter like oh, on I'm the sure. side to say, okay, this is how much time we need. So yes. yes. But pause the, for this what long. they must use to calculate how big of a laugh it's going. To, I mean, mm. like, I can't imagine. There's probably some algorithm that they use that's like, you know, tells them <laughs> what a normal, like, <laughs> it's just, you'll never watch it the same again, I guess is what I'm trying okay. to say. Very interesting. We've learned something near today, guys. There is a new show uh, that my wife started watching. I don't really like sitcoms, but I'll kind of like walk in and out of the room. Is it a new news show or is it a new show to you? Or, no, or her? it's since she thinks that Empty Nest is is, is a current recent. Film, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, a current exactly. Nest. You're like, I like the receptionist hair. And it's just like to the <laughs> ceiling with hairspray. <laughs> We don't need to talk about emptiness, but his secretary, I never can remember. It's not, um, it's not Crystal Bernard. It's has to be like her sister or something. Okay. Um, Anyway, she's kind of a sassy secretary. So sassy Southern secretary. The triple S. Yes. Man. Yep. Now I was thinking like uh, designing women. Yeah. Also wings Uh, has like a sassy, uh, you know, I don't know. Could be the same person. Oh, it's Park Overall. Is that a name? Yeah, Park Overall. She played Laverne. I think Kirk used to play a character named Lacey Underall, <laughs> but I could be wrong. Lacey Underall was uh, uh, Caddyshack. Right? Oh, that's right. I'm yeah. sorry. Yes. Park Overall. Mm-hmm. That is that her Christian name? I need to know. That's what it says. Okay. Well. She states that. Richard Mulligan was her mentor. Maybe that's why um, her career suddenly ended. <laughs> I know we've brought this up before. That Empty Nest exists in the same universe as Golden Girls. They, they're it's a shared. Uh, Is it really? Know, it's like a Marvel. You know. If we have talked about that, I have drank that memory away. Well, it's true. Okay. Because her name is Laverne Todd and her... Yep, uh, I see it right here. Also, she was in Vibes, which my wife watched for Mm. the first time last week, and uh, I think she enjoyed it. She wasn't laughing out loud, but I could tell. It was funny. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) It might be horrible. So Park Overall was in The Vanishing? I've talked about that just recently. Yeah. Biloxi Blues. Did you watch... Ugh. Well, Biloxi Blues, was it a uh, sequel, sort of speak, to like, uh, uh, what was that other movie? Something about memoirs. Oh, uh, br- br- uh, Bright, yeah. Brighton, Brighton Beach, Beach memoirs. Brighton Beach memoirs. Yeah. No. No, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Even if it was, I'm not going to talk about either one of those things. Okay. God, I hated Biloxi Blues. That's the one that they, on a... Sunday afternoon, when there is there is nothing to do, nothing on, you can be sure to find that playing somewhere mm-hmm. on just an endless loop. And it's not dramatic enough to be a drama, not funny enough to be a comedy. I don't mm-hmm. know what it is. I'd rather watch Empty Nest than that. I cannot remember any part of the movie it was yeah. not memorable to me but it always showed up as like you know 80s you know blockbuster films or something it, it shows I, up i don't agree it has christopher walken in it it's directed by I mike know. nichols i mean it should be i just i think it's just boring just Maybe. unbelievably boring so what about Brighton Beach memoirs then? That I have much less uh, knowledge about. Brighton yeah. Beach, that's like Jersey, isn't it? New Jersey? Um, I don't know. Casey Samasco was in uh, <laughs> Biloxi Blues. <laughs> Maybe that's what I was thinking. It's They're both written by Neil Simon. I think that's what it is. Sometimes I'll think that uh, Jonathan Silverman was in Biloxi Blues and vice he versa. Is. For, oh, okay. Okay. I was just looking at the trivia. It said that, yeah, he's he's got a bit part in it. Oh, my God. So we need to crack this uh, Biloxi verse. Uh, do they <laughs> exist in the same universe, do you think? I don't know. It does say David Schwimmer's movie debut, uncredited. If you had told me this morning that I was going to be having this conversation with you, <laughs> I would be like, shut the fuck Sorry. up. No, I'm not. But here we are. 
I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> this is how this episode's going to be. I might as well start it off on a weird foot. If you had told me this morning that I would be staring at Five-ish Finkel's face at 3.30 <laughs> in the afternoon, I wouldn't have believed you. Who? Five-ish Finkel. Uh-huh. He's ahead, Mr. Greenblatt in, uh, <laughs> in Brighton Beach Memoirs. Great. Oh, how can you delete a movie from IMDb? Or from my memory. <laughs> <laughs> or she could block it like you can on like Facebook yeah. or something. Um, no, I was getting that mixed up also with the movie called Mischief. Now that is something completely different. And I think it's what it was. All these movies were kind of based around the 50s and 60s. Right? Yeah, when it's really like, you know, 80s, mid 80s. Right. That uh, Mischief had, um, why can I not think of her? Uh, it was Kelly Preston. Yeah, Kelly Preston. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. Let me, uh, let's start the podcast. Oh, yeah. Uh, and say, uh, welcome to the yarn wall. Hi. <laughs> this is why you tune in because it's just two guys talking about <laughs> shows that were canceled 30 years ago. And that have nothing to do with what we want to talk about this episode. Nope. nope. Well, yeah. Maybe. That, that's why it's the yarn wall. Yeah. Is that we go all over the place and we may hit on things that we didn't even think we'd be talking about. Doing a deep dive on Herb Tarlick. <laughs> <laughs> well, my name is Tim Cornman. And hmm. with me as always is Jason, Jason Walker. Walker. Your name sounds... Is that a stage name or is that a... Uh, Tim Cornman? Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, I wish it was a stage name. It sounds fake to me. Well, <laughs> thanks. We've known know, each I, other for 23 years. I know, you I'm bring just... this up to me now? <laughs> I just, uh, you know, you need to do that uh, 23 and Me thing and really get oh. to the bottom. of Yes. Am I real? <laughs> yes. Are you just in a simulation? I have to admit, I know we had sort of a viewing assignment, like loosely, kind of, yeah. that I did not complete because we were watching nope. Westworld. So, Which is disappointing because I really do want to talk about fried berries. Hey, go ahead. You're not spoiling anything for me. Mm. I'm just like, is there something to talk about? I mean, I know there, is it just a bunch of scenes just kind of strung together with like, crazy shit or is there more of a story yeah that's about it yeah there's not a lot of story okay so many weird scenes and halfway into it you're still saying what the fuck am i watching uh-huh but it is totally enjoyable yeah um, I will say the music is well done in the movie is it not all just insane techno music yeah it is but it fits. Right, right. The guy who plays Barry, uh -huh. who is Gary Green. <laughs> it could okay. very well have just been fried Gary. Yeah. He is insanely bizarre looking. <laughs> His mannerisms are that of... Complete lunatic. Which actually fits since it is like a drug movie. Right, sure. Like train spotting was more like this. I would have enjoyed train spotting. Right. I don't know if I ever told you how much I did not like train spotting. <laughs> I've saw it a couple of times back in the day, and the literally the only scene that I can remember is the worst bathroom in Scotland or whatever. Or the baby on the ceiling. Oh yeah, I guess I, I guess yeah. But fried berry, I think this movie deserves to be talked about. It really okay. does because it's bizarre it's out there there's a few scenes where you're like holy shit what does it become now <laughs> and then it just kind of veers off into another direction right the colors are well played this guy gary green all i gotta say is, is he does a great job for being extraordinarily weird right i didn't think he was actually going to have any real lines in the movie uh-huh and he doesn't have a lot of dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, most of the movie is played off of his eyes and mouth movements. Right. <laughs> there's, just, there's a lot of camera angles that are from the front. So our our subjects are coming towards the camera. Uh-huh. 
and maybe even passing shit in the background that you'll see that's just strikingly odd things. Right. Well, it does kind of, I mean, it looks a little bit like um, Hardcore Harry or something where you're just right. constantly in a POV and it's just one long but shot. But this, you know? this isn't a POV. It's right. just uh, a front shot in which right, right. Barry is looking at everything <laughs> except for the camera, which right. then becomes very obvious that he's avoiding the camera. <laughs> right. So his weird face is what you see through the majority of the movie. Yes. Gotcha. I don't want to spoil anything. I'm not going to spoil anything. Okay. Guys, go out and see this movie. Jason, watch this movie. Okay, so we can I will. Please continue this conversation later. Yes. And we can actually converge on some collective thought. I promise. All right. I swear. But uh, Fried Berry, I will talk about Gary Green for just a second. Just okay. a brief second. Because he's been in a lot of shorts. He still does not have a profile picture on IMDb. It's just blank. No. He's been in, you know, a handful of things, 41 credits. He's been in a lot of short films. And if you notice that the director, Ryan Kruger, mm -hmm. he looks like he uses Gary Green quite often in his short yeah. films. And this was a short from, I believe, 2016, maybe. Oh, OK. No, 2017. It got a lot of recognition. And I think because of that recognition is why he went on to make this feature length film. Right. Using the same character. Right. They need the profile picture of the actor from the Friedberry uh, short. Mm hmm. It looks very weird. He looks like he's in like a, a Aphex twin video or something. And maybe that's why Ryan decided to use this guy, because he is so animated and strange looking. Yes. He's kind of in shape for an older yeah. guy, which we don't know how old he is. Oh. He's got a Iggy Pop of yes. <laughs> body. <laughs> I actually wrote that down in my notes. I was going to say, is Friedberry actually supposed to be titled... An afternoon in the, in the life of Iggy Pop. Yeah, unauthorized <laughs> so, biography of Iggy Pop. Right. I love this. On the short, it just says, Friedberry is heroin junkie. So I don't right. think these people are um, American. Now, they are South African, I believe. Uh, yeah, okay. That kind of explains a couple of things. His teeth looks like they're dancing in his head like it's a Monty Python skit. And you can't get past that because you get some close-ups on this guy's face yeah. quite often and his mouth and his open, agape mouth, I will just say. Yeah. He has the ability to dislocate his jaw wow. and pop it back into place. He's like um, Ernest, you know. Uh, uh, right, right, Jim Varney. <laughs> Jim Varney. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> But uh, this guy, Gary Green, was also in Escape Room. That's okay. probably the most well-known movie just recently that came out with him in it. He plays um, a technician, I guess, for the I, – I have no idea. Okay. It's a, it's a minor, minor role. So I, I have watched Escape Room. I mean, there were scenes that I really enjoyed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's an okay movie. If you've got nothing better to watch. <laughs> I don't even know if I know what that is. It's kind of playing on the same type of situation. You get multiple people that are showing up that they don't know why they're there. Uh-huh. It kind of gave me that feeling. Kind of like, um, is there unknown? Is that what it was? Where the guys just wake up in the middle of the room and they're, oh, how the fuck did we get here? It's kind of like a saw feel right. to it. Right, right, right. This seems more sophisticated than Saw, but mm -hmm. maybe not. You know, a little over the top where, you know, they're still in an escape room, but it's, it's an outdoor setting and it's snowing. Right. It was interesting. If you've got nothing better to watch, you know, go watch that. Okay. It'll entertain. That's a hell of a uh, plug. Yeah. <laughs> um, why are we talking about that? I don't know. Because Gary Green was in it. Right. Anyway. That's enough. That's enough of that. I don't want to spoil any more of uh, Fried Berry. We'll get back to that when you have had a chance to watch it. Okay. I'm sad that you didn't watch it because there is so much to talk about. It wasn't happening. I, ha I had mm -hmm. too much to do. I'm sorry. 
And then when I finally sat down, I watched the first, literally like the first five minutes and just completely passed out on the couch. Oh, awesome. But man, let me tell you something. I'm looking at the cast for the new WKRP in Cincinnati, and it (laughs) is full of, I mean, like, Michael DeBar is in this. Do you know who uh, Michael DeBar is? Um, Is he part of Belle Biv DeVoe? Maybe. (laughs) That remains to, uh, wow, he's been in a lot of stuff. I've bitten off more than I can chew with this. This Mm -hmm. This is deep. You've brought it up before. The new WKRP? Maybe I did. Yeah, we've talked about it. I just Because we went on a WKRP in Cincinnati kick for quite some time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, never mind. I'm sorry I brought it up. No, no. It has two seasons. Yeah, just two seasons. I mean, more than one is, like, surprising to me. (laughs) (laughs) I'm clicking off of this. All right. I've got several things to talk about. I, well, we need to wrap up Phantasm. Okay, sure. Because I know that I had a lot to talk oh, about uh, in watching these behind the scenes footage things. Yes. And I cut myself short. Otherwise, we would have had a four hour episode. Yeah. And just to let our audience know that I I cut a lot out of our films. No. What are you saying to me? Yeah. The raw, the raw audio for Phantasm is like two hours and 45 minutes. Ooh. And I'm hoping to get it down to about two hours. Wow. And that's for the director's cut. So I cut a lot of it out that, you know, I know you, you wonder how can we go astray where what we're talking about has nothing to do with anything. I was just thinking the same thing. <laughs> how... How is that possible? How's that even possible? It's just like it's possible that we've been talking now for 30 minutes and we have not said jack shit. I think we covered a lot of territory in 30. (laughs) You say 30 minutes? 30 minutes. Seemed like much longer than that. Okay. I mean, we're doing the Lord's work. Can you really put a time limit on that? We wouldn't have to do his work if he would get off his lazy ass. Yeah, that's for sure. (laughs) You're not on break. Step it up. God, <laughs> you got time to lean, you got time to clean, or whatever. <laughs> I got, I'm going to have to cut all of that out. <laughs> Why? All right. You're not offended by I can't talk about no. little people. No. We can blaspheme. Look, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like sometimes we are blaspheming little people. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So let's talk, let's talk about Phantasm okay. and Phantasm 2. I've got some notes written down here, and this is basically going off of all the trivia between the two films of stuff that I thought needed to be talked about, but maybe I didn't include that in the episodes. Or maybe we skipped over it because there was so much information on these films that it was hard to decipher or filter through. Right. So. And from what I, all of the supplemental stuff that I've been looking at, especially like Joe Bob, uh, last drive in, you know, mm-hmm. uh, because Reggie's on, you know, they did all of them for Christmas and Reggie's on a couple of them. And it really seems like he knows exactly what the phantasm universe is, what, what's going on, you know? Okay. I don't think he is ever credited as a, uh, writer or a you know producer I think well so. uh, he sure is he's billed as a co-producer on a ravager okay and ravager was the last one right yes i really liked the uh, masters of horror um incident on and off a mountain road have you right. do you remember that one uh-huh and reggie's in that as i can't see what his character's name is but man i must have like really I glossed over that because I I don't remember him. He's easy to spot. Oh, he looks exactly the same now as he did. Isn't that kind of odd where, like, he is bald, but he has, like, his side hair, you know, kind of like a... (laughs) That's what they call it, side hair. (laughs) Side hair. But not a hair less or more... Than when we saw him in the 70s in yeah. Phantasm. You got a good point. It, he's just unable to grow it there. Yeah. Yeah. Like he puts 
like weed killer on his head or something. Mm -hmm. It just won't grow there anymore. And maybe we didn't necessarily see it so much in the first movie, but the second movie, when that girl is making out with his scalp. Like his head is her erogenous zone somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Reg, you look like a big penis. That's so weird. He should have just kept the uh, boogie down hat on the entire time. We wouldn't be talking about this. There is a penis scene, by the way, in Fried Berry that I can't whoa, wait not whoa, to talk whoa, about. Whoa. On a yeah. scale of like one to street trash, what are we talking about here? It's not as funny. <laughs> they didn't toss it around like a damn football. So Okay. All right. So for where his penises go, I'm sorry, street trash has it. Awesome. Or had it. It slipped right out of their hands. <laughs> oh. All right. Moving on. Okay. I've got my notes basically just copied from IMDb. So all of this information that I'm reading off is strictly from the trivia between the two films. 80% of our shows are just Mm -hmm. us reciting things that we Googled. Don Coscarelli's mother, a novelist named Kate Coscarelli, held several titles on the production and even used two aliases. As S. Tyler and Shirley May. She okay. also wrote a novel adaptation of based on the film. Okay. And wait a minute. I'm sorry. Who is this? This is Don Coscarelli's mother. Okay. Don Coscarelli's mom. Okay. Okay. She wrote a novel adaptation of the film and it was published in 2002. Oh my God. 2002. Yeah, only 500 copies were produced. <laughs> oh, no. So, put that on my Christmas list. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. I'm I'm very intrigued. We'll even take one that's even slightly burned. Well, his mother must have been in her 70s or 80s when she wrote that. Maybe. Oh, that's very interesting. She was going through dementia as she's writing oh, about dimensions. Content, please. Yeah. I think I brought that up the other day at work was like, well, what if dementia was actually you just being stuck between two different dimensions? Ooh. Then I tripped out for a couple of seconds. They kicked me out. I had to go to HR. (laughs) Oh, you took yourself to HR? (laughs) Yeah. Turn yourself in? Like, I'm checking myself in. (laughs) Here's my urine. I went ahead and peed in this cup. (laughs) Just jump onto the uh, gurney that they have in there, like Tom Hanks and the birds. Yes. (laughs) Throws the gurney into the ambulance and then jumps on top of it. Oh, I love that. Makes me laugh every time. I don't remember what we said about... Um, I don't know if I'll have a chance to bring it up again. I mean, I do have a podcast. I guess I could, but... Yeah. Uh, I will not remember to bring it up. But. Right. Exactly. I got to do it now. Reggie and his wife were uh, made a short film based on One for the Road, Stephen King's short okay. story. Uh-huh. And... I think they filmed the short, but they were trying to get funding to turn it into like a feature length movie, I think. That's and cool. uh, are you familiar with that story? Todd had us watch the right for the yes. road. Yes. Which was not very good at all. Right. Now, okay. I don't remember. Did that have anything to do with Reggie? I don't think so. No. I don't think so. I think it was a different thing. But, you know, Stephen King has this thing that. You know, you can buy the rights for his... Yeah, for a dollar. For a dollar, yeah, for his short stories. I think that you have to turn it over to him just so he could watch it. <laughs> I think that's what the what the catch is. Right, <laughs> He's yeah. He's the only one that gets to see it. Right? Yeah. All right, so the idea to create the film came out when Reggie Bannister approached Don Coscarelli with the idea to adapt Ray Bradbury's novel, Something Wicked This Way Comes. Okay. Which was to star a Michael Baldwin and Don McCann from Kenny and Company. Okay. However, the two learned that very week that Bradbury had sold the novel rights to Disney. This is happening back in the day before they made the Disney movie or? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. That makes this, more sense. Reggie went to Don Coscarelli saying, hey, we should do this story. And then they found out that Disney bought it. Oh, "Oh, just a little too late. Yeah. God, I can't imagine what that fucking movie would be like. I mean, the the one who who directed that 
original mm. one that scared the shit out of us. You should have that in your mind. Oh, man, I don't even know. Mm, a quick Google search. Damn it, my fingers can't move fast enough. Not enough light in room to see keyboard. <laughs> my keyboard's lit and it's not helping. Edit all this out. <laughs> Somehow I got onto the George Harrison wiki. It was directed by Jack Clayton. Oh, okay. And who is Jack Clayton? Uh, yeah. You may never know. <laughs> uh, such great movies like The Lonely Passion of Judith Hearn. <laughs> Uh, um, 1974, The Great Gatsby. Oh, okay. No, there's something. Yeah, Mia Farrow and Robert Redford. He uh, directed that. Okay. So why didn't he go on to be this just famous director? I don't know. Huh. Anyway, yeah. Something to think about. Sure. Actually, just cut all this out because it <laughs> hit a <laughs> it brick went, wall. It went nowhere. Well, that movie really did freak me out. Something Wicked This Way comes? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's so much shit like that from back in the day where it's like, I can't believe they let us watch this. I mean, yeah. <laughs> that's what I was going to talk about a little later on is a, a I can't believe we're watching this type of thing. Is that a new uh, podcast we got to start? I can't believe we're watching this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's even better than moratorium. Look, we're going to have to talk <laughs> off mic about this. <laughs> think anybody will notice when i change the title of the podcast <laughs> if anyone notices then we'll give that person all of our promotional stuff <laughs> yes i did not i do not remember pam greer being in something wicked this way comes hmm. this is more than i can get into right now yeah we'll that come back is, to that. that is wild okay the title was changed from phantasm to the never dead for mm. Australian audiences, as to not confuse it with the popular Aussie sex comedy, World of Sexual Fantasy, from 1976, which was also known as Phantasma. I think we could have figured it out. I mean, I'm so glad that, I mean, Phantasm is the only thing that this movie could be called. Uh, although The Never Dead, I do like that title. Yeah, that's okay. But I also like the title of The World of Sexual Fantasy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so. just that. Just you know what you're getting. So the line, the funeral is about to begin, sir, was also used as an introduction to the song Maggot Sermon <laughs> by the band Splatterhouse from their split with gruesome stuff relish. Oh, I remember that. You know, you remember Gruesome Stuff Relish? No, I was lying. I just wanted you to think I was cool. There are a couple of different instances throughout these films that there were some heavy metal bands that were stealing lines from this movie. Mm -hmm. And I kind of dig that, that yeah. they have this following. Sure. Skinny Puppy does that a lot. They have yeah. like tons of, uh, you know, Argento Italian movie quotes. And, you know, I can't remember what song it is, but there's one video that is just spliced together scenes from Argento movies and Fulci movies. Okay. I'll, I would watch that right now. Oh, it's, it's awesome. I'll look that up. So here's another one. It says about five minutes into the film, the line of dialogue, the funeral is about to begin, sir, was also used by black metal band Marduk. Okay. And their track titled Hearse <laughs> from the album World Funeral. Do those have question marks at the end or did you add that when you said them? <laughs> Uh, also by the death metal band Ravenous in the track of their first album, Assembled in Blasphemy. Uh, I, I, death metal band Mortician also used it as an intro to their song, Mortician, on their album, Hacked Up for Barbecue. <laughs> oh my God, you're making me hungry. <laughs> So things to take from this. I don't know <laughs> any of I don't know any of the bands that you just said. Same here. Sounds fucking awesome, but I I, I yeah. just don't know. 
who does not want to hear the song Maggot Sermon? Yeah, by Ravenous? <laughs> is that who you said that was? That was uh, Splatterhouse. That'd be a good prank to pull on like a pastor, just like put a bunch of maggots in his Bible. And when he opens it up, he's like, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> I'm not mad at you. You're just going to hell. The album World Funeral sounds awesome. Yeah. From okay. 2003. Uh, assembled in Blasphemy was 2000. So, it's, anyway. It's like Ikea. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> it's assembled with Blasphemy. Assembled yeah. with Blasphemy. You're just screaming God damn it the entire time. <laughs> That's it. Also, there is a death metal band called Embalmer. If you, I just looked it up. All right. Embalmer. Uh, they only do love stories, right? I like it when they're, you know, there's all these guys with just like big long beards and sleeveless shirts, but they, <laughs> they're good. in like a beautiful park. Like, it's funny just okay. to think about kids like having their birthday party like 20 feet away from these guys. Um, Which speaking of, oh God, something else I wanted to freaking bring up. I'm sorry. Going back to fried berry. Okay. The actor Gary Green was in a movie called Berserker. Okay. From 2004. Okay. I watched the trailer for it. Okay. This has Craig Schaefer. Oh. Has Carrie Wurr. What? I never could say her name correctly. Kari. Carrie Wurr. Carrie Wurr. Yeah. Whatever. Sure. It's Berserker, but it's also called like Hell's Warrior or something like that. Oh, okay. So it's like a Norse thing. Craig Schaefer is in, yes, he's in all leather. He's got a fucking wig on that hair goes down to his nipples. I'm listening. He's wielding a sword throughout most of this. <laughs> it looks atrocious and I can't wait to see it. Awesome. His character's name is Boar. <laughs> Anyway, it looks like it's medieval. It looks like there's a lot of scenes with, you know, swords and, and sorcery. But in the trailer, there's one scene that a character gets picked up like by the throat uh -huh. and flung off of a building and lands on a Volkswagen bug. And I was like, what? wait a minute. Now do we have like a Beastmaster 2 situation? Yeah. Because where did that come from? I just realized uh, Riff Tracks did <laughs> did that movie. I was, I've seen that movie before. Oh, my God. And while I was watching it, I was like, there was a very brief period of time where he was like in everything, you know, he was kind of that like, um, you know, if the 90s had like a Brat Pack sort of thing, okay. they'd all show up in each other's movies, you know. So you're just talking about Craig Shaper yes, himself? Yes, yes. I do not generally like sports <laughs> films unless the sport is like, you know, not the main thing. Or like the running man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, now that I can get behind. But for some reason, the program, do you remember that movie? With yeah. The, yeah. I have seen that fucking movie, I don't know, 30 times. I mean, again, it's just because of. Uh, Christy Swanson. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, no. It's looking up David Ward. He's the one that did uh, the program. Weren't we just talking about him related to no, something we, else? No, we weren't. <laughs> uh, when are we going to do the Milagro Beanfield War on this podcast? <laughs> I, I have never seen that. I could probably describe what I thought it was about, and it's completely different than what, yeah. what, it, what he actually was about. Oh, anyway, it just seemed like Craig Schaefer like fell off the. I mean, if he's in uh, the Berserker, you know, something's wrong. He's he's either owes people money or uh, <laughs> you know something's up. Maybe I don't know. Looking at the trailer though, and watching the trailer, it looks absolutely bizarre. Now that I know that Rift Tracks covered, it's it, very stupid. I can't wait. <laughs> to you listen should, to it. Yes, you should. So you should watch that. It, it it's insane. Lots of really crappy special effects. If you told me it was a Charles Band movie, I would not be surprised at all. All right, so I'm I'm done talking about Friedberry now. This is I had to bring that up. I'm glad you've seen it, and uh, I can't wait to get into it. But let's get back to to Phantasm for a moment here. Okay. The effect of having the door pulled off of its hinges 
and flying into the house was achieved by having co-producer Paul Pepperman standing behind the door. Pepperman. <laughs> Pepperman. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know why I felt compelled to say it like that. <laughs> Paul Pepperman remembers. <laughs> that the door had already been removed from its hinges. Then he ran at full force into the house, holding the door in front of him the whole time, making it appear as if the door had magically flown off. If you look very carefully, you can see the door bouncing along instead of flying smoothly. What I what, what scene are you talking about? Is it in the first one? Yes, and this is all from Phantasm 1. I'll let you know when I'm going into Phantasm 2. Okay. And this was actually in some of the behind the scenes footage. And like I said, I will be posting this on our, I'll probably put it on our YouTube group and I'll, I'll save it as like a playlist because okay. there's so many behind the scenes things. Awesome. I, I'll probably add a, a link onto our website as well, because why not? After watching all that, would you just go nuts if there was like a director's cut or something? Like, would you oh. want, because Phantasm is like pretty perfectly paced yes you know and don actually talks about this in the trivia as well that he said something about in different horror movies when he set out to make this that he wanted some jump type of scare sure every five minutes right 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 which keeps the pacing go at a great you know i think he got tired of seeing trailers of movies that showed all the scares and you watched the oh. movie and you got nothing right yeah plus like Especially a story like Phantasm, where let's not let the audience think too hard about what they just saw. Let's move on to the next thing, because <laughs> if you do, you're going to be like, wait a minute, what? I guess that's what our job is. Yes. To question all of that. But on the behind the scenes footage, it did show that uh, Paul Pepperman. Love that guy. Pepperman. Actually, there were some like some leather straps on the back of the door Go so he on. could put his arm in kind of like a shield. Oh, cool. But they had like a motorcycle helmet on him. So this is what he had for Whoa. protection. They didn't have, you know, the budget to hire any stunt men. It's like, what can you do? Yeah. <laughs> Just make Reggie fall down again. Yes. <laughs> again and again. When they show him being Reggie being pulled and those yeah. barrels being thrown at him. Yeah. That was Reggie. That yeah. was nobody else. <laughs> right, right, right. It'd be hard to find a stuntman that looked just like. Right. But as we know, it's okay to find a stuntman that looks like a Michael Baldwin. You get a girl to do it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Any girl from around, you know, take your Daphne Zuniga's or your, yeah. uh, you know. Or in this case, as if it was Lori Laughlin and probably not the one we want it to be. <laughs> it's spelled the same, I think. It's spelled the same. Anyway, uh, Don Coscarelli notes his frustration with a lot of horror films as he watched when he was younger, that he would see the ads for these films and being frightened by what he saw in the ads. But in the movies themselves, it rarely lived up to that. He wanted to make a film that a scary moment happened at least five minutes. That's what I was talking about. That sounds like so, a uh, kind of Roger Corman. And yeah. Uh, algorithm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Several scenes were shot and cut out. Some of these actually show up in the film's third sequel, Phantasm Oblivion. <laughs> That's kind of hard to think about. Yeah. So Phantasm 4. Good Lord. Don Coscarelli mentions that in one scene in particular involving Jody and Mike's aunt, the actress playing the aunt was the same actress who plays the fortune teller's grandmother. She stepped into the grandmother's role when the original actress who Angus Grimm had brought on board, was unable to make the shoot. <laughs> Angus has just got all the seniors just, like, yes, ready to... Well, I, I wonder, <laughs> did, did we ever figure out how how old Angus was during the first movie? Hmm. I mean, I guess we could do some quick addition, but... I'm sure you could look it up, like, really, really fast. Uh, it's just, he's just looked the same for so long, and it's just oh, yeah. weird when... Uh, Angus was born in 1926, and this came out in 79, so there you go. He was only 53, 54? I've, yeah, exactly. That's fucked up. No. That's so strange. He would make a good Mr. Burns if they ever made like a live uh, <laughs> Simpsons movie. Except he's dead. So. <laughs> yeah, well, except, sure. 
<laughs> if he wasn't, though, Tim. Okay. If he wasn't. Gotcha. In that alternate dimension or other planet. Yes. The less said about that, the better. All right. I'll, I'll move on. I'm looking at a Phantasm II uncut. Do you know? Do, are you aware of a different? I think it came out recently. And the trivia does say here that the one guy in one guy, the ball drained his blood and he pissed his pants. Yeah. Right. And they tried to get him to cut the, the urination out of the scene yeah. to get the R rating. We were like, that was what was going to cost you to. Yeah. It was shocking, I guess. I remember there being more blood being shot in that ball. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it one of those things that is just yeah. a fake memory that I've implanted that seemed like it went on forever? Right, like a Mandela effect. It was that jarring in my memory that I just remember it just spraying forever. Well, I've got one of those. And the one little thing that I want to talk about, that that's a I want to discuss something very similar. Okay, I'll get I'll get through this. Oh no, take your time. I I love talking about Reggie's hair and how old <laughs> Angus Scrim is. Don Coscarelli handled the camera work for the film, sometimes at risk to his own safety. Uh-oh. In the chase sequence when Mike was driving and Jody was firing the shotgun at the pursuing hearse, yeah. Coscarelli was sitting in the trunk of the Barracuda. <laughs> Thornberry fired the shotgun almost directly at him for one shot. No one on the crew being aware that even firing a blank shoots out a hot projectile that could kill at close range. <laughs> right. That was whoever wrote that was a sadistic monster because that's a horrible sense. Yes, that was hard to read. But. In some of the behind the scenes footage, it did talk about that in order to protect Don Coscarelli, they put aluminum foil on the side of his head. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it, it shows him handling the camera with that aluminum foil. It's kind of kind of amusing. Without even knowing that, that scene seems dangerous, like to the yes. other people involved in it, too. When Angus Grimm shows up. And grabs Michael. I think this is after he escapes the bedroom and he runs out, only be confronted by the tall man at the front door. Right. And the tall man grabs him and just kind of carries him, uh, you know, by the back of his jacket. Yeah. His jean jacket and throws him in the back of the hearse. Yeah. They tried different ways on filming that and to make it look because obviously, to, uh, I'm sorry, Angus Scrim is not strong enough to do that when A. Michael Baldwin weighed you know over a hundred pounds right yeah yeah so they tried to do different things in order to get it to work mm -hmm. and what they came up with is they actually had michael step up onto the dolly rig of the where the camera oh, okay. was so in that shot actually the camera was being handheld and they used the dolly so Mike is basically just standing on the dolly and they're just positioning the camera so it looks like the tall man has him from the back of the jacket. Gotcha. I mean it worked. But it really worked. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Framing those shots and all of that 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 is his like that's why his movies his movies look so good. You know, oh, I, yeah. I mean he just I has a very uh like composition and stuff like that. He's just the master of that stuff. After filming the scene where this character is killed by one of the silver spheres, Kenneth V. Jones was too tired to take off his makeup. So he drove home in it. As he did, he was pulled over by a police officer. <laughs> now, this is the guy that pissed his pants, probably? Yes. Okay. Who? So he was pulled over by a police officer who was naturally suspicious of him being covered in fake blood sure. and didn't immediately buy his story about being an actor. Oh, man. So good stuff. Yeah. Let's go on to talk about Phantasm 2 some now. Okay. Okay, and then, and then we can get on with the rest of the show. Okay. Now, there's a bunch of stuff on Phantasm 2, but a lot of it is talking about the deleted scenes as well. Okay. So, 
Universal executives wanted to recast both A. Michael Baldwin and Reggie Bannister because they were unknown and had been out of the movie business since the release of the first movie. Right. Don Coscarelli resisted the efforts and was forced to audition A. Michael Baldwin and Reggie Bannister. In the end, his efforts won only that he was able to keep one of them and replace the other. Don Coscarelli chose to keep Reggie Bannister, and they recast James Legro in Baldwin's place. I think that was a very wise <laughs> decision. Well, I've heard so many different stories from this, from watching the behind-the-scenes stuff. Mm -hmm. I thought this before, that they wanted to get a bigger-named actor. Yeah. And James Legro being on the low end of a new sprouting career that they wanted to, to cash in on. But I think I read something that A. Michael Baldwin, he understands that they wanted to recast him, mm -hmm. but now he's also resentful, so he doesn't even talk about Phantasm 2. So, so oh, <laughs> yeah. Know. Some feelings yeah. were hurt during all of that. I think so. That sucks. Reggie Bannister had to quit acting. In the nine years between Phantasm and Phantasm Two, yeah, nine and worked years. for a time at the funeral home and assisted in embalming bodies. And we talked about this briefly because that's what was uh, was stated in the behind the scenes right. footage. Right, and uh, and we talked about the heavy metal band Embalmer earlier. So. Yes, <laughs> remember if you're keeping score. Yes. The project of a sequel to Phantasm in 1979 was greenlit and financed by Universal Pictures, mainly because one of the main executives at the studio was a big fan of horror movies, as well as being Don Coscarelli's former attorney. So that, that helped. <laughs> How do you go from, from being an attorney to being an executive at Universal Pictures? That's freaking awesome. I don't know. I mean, yeah, that makes sense, I guess. At about 55 minutes, the scene in which Father Myers has one of his ears cut off by the sphere oh, was man. shot by having the actor lying on a table with the camera lying on its side, given the appearance of standing upright. The sequence ended up having to be filmed twice because of the key scene of the sphere passing by his head and the ear being cut off occurred in a split second between frames of the first take. Yeah, we already talked enough about that, but that's just pretty badass. Yeah. I think they used this same technique in several of their scenes. Right. Well, you know, it only takes three pounds of pressure to pull off a human ear, so. Really? I, I don't know. I've just always heard That's that. what I've heard? <laughs> I, I really don't know if that is, uh, that might be just a uh, urban legend. I'm not sure. Somebody needs to look that it up. It may have been just what your mom told Probably. you when she was grabbing your ear. You know. Three pounds of pressure, I could have this fucking ear. Yeah. If I wanted this ear, I'm just warning you. Parents I could around take this the ear. world are just like, I mean. Remember when your grandfather took your nose? Exactly. Huh? Huh? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> when he was drunk. I'm looking at the time in between sequels, you know, like what's the uh -huh. longest time in between sequels? Uh, Fury Road, it was almost 30 years no for, from uh, wow. Thunderdome. Man, wow. and that, and then that one being like the best movie of all of them. I mean, oh. maybe Road Warrior, but I mean, really love oh, Fury Road, so and I can't good. wait for Furiosa. Yep, that's a TV show, right? Mm, or is no, it a I movie? It was a feature film. Oh yeah. man, I got to look it up. Here, due to the passing of the original Sphere designer Willard Green in 1977, the newer, deadlier Spheres. Included the ultimate killing machine gold sphere, which was nicknamed the Rambo sphere, <laughs> was created by Steve Patino and his then 15 year old assistant, Steve Costraneo. I don't know who he is. All right. Sadly, Steve passed away uh, in 94. Due to a ball incident on the set of it? Maybe. I'd like to think so. I uh, looked up uh, Steve Patino. And uh, he had 33 credits in the special effects department, which included From Beyond, oh. Predator, wow. The Monster Squad, Hell Comes to Frogtown, Pumpkinhead, Deep Star Six, uh, Netherworld, speaking of Charles Band, okay. Scanner Cop 2. Do those occur in the transverse? 
It's like Scanner Cops versus Doll Man or something. Ooh. And I would watch that. Dangerous Toys are involved. <laughs> all, or is, that, is that what it was? Dangerous Toys? I feel like that was a hair metal band from the 90s. <laughs> it looks like there were two Scanner Cop films. Okay. I am blanking. Oh, Tim Thomerson is the one that played. Uh, right. Isn't he Doll Man? Yes, he is. Okay, but he's the guy in Trancers. Too. All these are related right. He's somehow. Jack Death in Trancers. Right, right, right. Yes. That is so funny. I have such fond memories of that movie, but haven't watched it in a million years. I haven't watched it since mm-hmm. I was like 15 or something. I uh, almost did a deep dive on Tim Thomerson yeah. today. He's pretty awesome. Uh, who do I have for a deep dive? Uh, we're going to jump around on a couple of people, I think. Oh, okay. <laughs> so. Helen Hunt was in Trancers. Must have been one of her first movies. She looks very young. Oh, wow. Anyway, um, Steve Patino. I, uh, Stevie. We thank you for your uh, service. Service, yeah. It says here he did the makeup department in Critters. Oh, uh, man. He worked on uh, The Reanimator. Do you think he took a critter home with him? I would Ooh. have. I have nothing else to say about that. <laughs> yes, I, I would have as well. <laughs> I mean, come on. Man, Trancers looks awesome. I, I'm going to watch this sometime soon. So the metal band White Zombie included a sample of the tall man's line. You think that when you die, you go to heaven. You come to us. Pretty good. Thank you. It is on the song. I think it's supposed to be Disaster Blaster, but it says Diaster Blaster. <laughs> I don't know what a diaster is. <laughs> I don't know. Is that somebody that has two asses? I've got a Maybe, diaster. I guess. Yeah. One's one's mean and one's nice. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. So let's talk about this. A bootlegged work print features several additional scenes not included in the wide release of the film, minus the sound effects or background music. There are also additional shots of gore that were snipped in order to avoid an X rating. But that's what we need to see. The scenes included are, after Mike blows up the house in the beginning, there is no funeral scene. After Reggie runs out, Mike runs out and Reggie says he knew it before it was going to happen. Mike tells Reggie that they will probably die trying to find the tall man. And Reggie replies, hey, we all got to go sometime. This is the the bit of dialogue that I said that it was actually overlapped on part of the uh, car scene. Okay. They just kind of reused the audio. But I did see the little scene. It's on some of the behind the scenes footage. I think they made the right choice there. Right. Because I think they were actually laying on the ground, you know, the house is burning and they're like, hey, man. We got to go find this tall man. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, your your house just blew up with all your family yeah. members in He's it. He's like, I was just laying here thinking, <laughs> we need to we need to find that guy because he just blew up my house. Yeah, I can still hear my family members screaming. <laughs> yeah, we have time to. I mean, we could. L- let's lament about this for a we moment. We could at least call the fire department. I just, I'm just gonna lay here for a little while. I'm, I am bushed. You tackled me to the ground kind of softly, but eh, yeah, I'm I'm good. Yeah. After Mike encounters the Liz lookalike and sees the worm type creature crawl out of her back and Reggie torches it with the flamethrower, Mike wakes up, finding out it was all a dream. And Reggie tells him to get ready as they're going to leave and get in the car. Yeah. Again. Probably not adding a lot to that. Right. Uh, There is a rumored scene that Mike has a dream that he makes love with Liz all over the world. (laughs) I don't need to see any of that. That was the scene that I was telling you about. It looked like they were free falling in space and time. Yeah. They're just embraced, but this is different background flying past them. Yeah. Yeah. Like a Tom Petty uh, video. Yeah. The sphere attack on Father Myers is also much gorier. We see a bigger geyser of blood spurt out the back of the spear. Now we're getting to it. Mm-hmm. 
and we see a huge puddle of blood forming in front of him. So this is what I thought I saw, but possibly also exists. Huh. When Mike and Liz are sleeping in an abandoned manor, after Mike kisses Liz, they have a telepathic love scene. Oh my and God. after it finishes, Liz tells Mike, that's about the safest sex we'll ever have. <laughs> Ooh, I do not like that either. I do not like that at all. I love Phantasm 2. That was about the only thing that I was... Them smiling and reacting to how neat it is to be able to read each other's uh-huh. thoughts was... I did not like that. Not a fan. Not a fan of that. Uh, When the gold ripper sphere drives itself into the caretaker's back and sends him flying across the casket room, there's a lot more blood squirting from his body. I wanted to see more of that. Oh, sure. They could have spent a lot more time throwing blood. Yeah. After the tall man's body is pumped full of acid... Mike and Reggie and Liz escape with alchemy in the hearse. We then see a new tall man come out of the space gate, and we see him throwing the dead tall man back into it. Yeah, I've seen that scene. It's just like a little doll body, or, you know, he picks it up (laughs) like it weighs like nothing. It says now it's in the beginning of Phantasm 3. Okay. So they just reused it. Right, right. Hmm. Yep. I think they made the right decision on all of that stuff. Interesting stuff. Lots and lots of shit on Phantasm and Phantasm 2. Guys, if you haven't seen either one of these films, we urge you, please, run out there and watch these. Even the later ones, are they're silly, but they're still, there's some good stuff. We've got to find this book. Oh, yeah. We need to read this book based on Phantasm. Yes, for sure. Written by... Don Coscarelli's aged mother. Yeah. Mama Coscarelli. <laughs> All right. You ready to go take a break before we get started with our showdown? Let's take a break. Hey, freaksters and freakettes. It's Tim from the Moratorium. Do you like the sweet sounds of our witty banter in your ears every week? Well, head on over to our Patreon. And for only $3 a month, you can get even more. In the director's cuts of our movie episodes. On average, that's 20 minutes more of our wise cracking, jive talking, and lip flapping laughter straight to your ear holes. Go to themoratorium.com and click on our Patreon link, and you'll find five awesome tiers with tons of goodies. You can also find our Teespring link on the website for even more awesome merch. Thank you for your support. Now on with the show. I guess we can get on with the podcast since we were just talking about coffee for 10 minutes. (laughs) Welcome to coffee talk. Mm -hmm. But wasn't that a character with uh, Mike Myers? Oh, yeah. Uh, I forget what her name is. Yeah. He was always so verklempt. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. Never knew if he was just (laughs) making up that like words or if that actually means something might never know i you've used that before so i assumed it was actual word (laughs) no but i just lifted it from uh saturday night life gilda radner she did a character that was uh oh she was i so many different characters roseanne rosanna dana (laughs) probably but no she did a segment that was uh on like weekend update that Uh was like behoove your uvula (laughs) and (laughs) I, That's fun I didn't to say. know what a uvula was until it then. Sounds dirty. It's not. I mean, I it's guess not. it could be. <laughs> you make it dirty if you really try. But uh, my sister actually posted on social media the other day asking what that was called. Mm-hmm. You know, an improper name for it. The little thing in the back of your throat. I called it a throat scrote. Ew. <laughs> I don't like that at all. <laughs> don't like it one <laughs> bit. What would you call it? Uh, throat scrub. Oh, <laughs> damn it. Damn it. <laughs> it's the only word that really fits now. Really, it is. You, uh, you need to TM that. All right. Are you ready to go and do some deep dives? Um, sure. Do you have somebody you want to talk about? Well, I hope I remember what I said earlier about, uh, I'm sorry. I was just looking at Craig Schaefer's mullet. I think that was <laughs> like. <laughs> it has its own website. I think it's so funny that, um. 
Why am I blanking on um Oh gosh. He was uh he was in the gate. He was the bad guy in Blade. Uh yeah, Steven Dorf. Dorf, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dorf on golf. Yeah. He is the new Walker, Texas Ranger. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I, I think I watched the first episode and said you know, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, his like his intimidation factor is cut uh, because he's like five three. He's like he's like shorter than Prince or something. I like him as an actor. I just I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. He's all right. Blade. Man, I loved that movie when it first came out. I think you and I did. You and I go and see that together. Ooh, that's hard to say. I don't remember. I don't remember Probably either, not. but but just that last fight, the whole movie's so badass and like, you know, all these cool weapons and shit and mm-hmm. they just gave him like red eyes and did a bunch of like editing tricks and <laughs> it just was a big letdown. I think that's what I think about when I think of Blade. I'm like, ah, it, that and end fight could have been so much better. Yeah. It had the guy from uh, Grounded for Life. I can't remember what his name is. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Love that fuck. Oh, uh, Donald Donald Logue. Donald Logue. I like him. Grounded for Life is a fucking funny show. Oh, that's why True Detective. I think Stephen Dorff was in like the third season. I think it was. Oh, okay, is that correct? I yeah. do not know. I only watched the first season. Um, you can skip the second. Go straight to the third. It it's good. I probably won't get around to it. My window for watching that is has passed, I think. Oh, okay. But, man, that first season was so good. Holy shit. Yeah. Anyway. So, so, anyway, the, so the only Dorf. thing that I could... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know where that came from. Uh, that's what these episodes are all about, right? It's just like... All right. Just free, free association. <laughs> It's called take three hours out of your day. Yeah. Yeah. To let is. our audience know that we're actually recording on Saturday afternoon, which yep. is a rarity. Yep. Although now it's going to be two weeks past. Happy Mother's Day to yeah. all you mothers out there. Happy day. We should have did Mother's Day. For yeah. Mother's Day? Yeah. Trauma oh. movie. That movie is so crazy. We are we are cheap. I'll tell our audience right now. We are cheap. Yeah. If Troma wanted to sponsor us and every month we would watch one of their films, I'd be all for it. Getting paid to watch a Troma movie? Yeah. We'll take just about anything. Yep. We're like at the end of our career, like Craig Schaefer, like, oh. uh, I'll do anything at this point. Yeah, literally <laughs> <No>. anything. <laughs> you want me to dress up in a, you know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Uh, dot, dot, dot. I, wa- I was going to say duck suit. Okay. I don't know why You think that... he's tall enough to play uh, the new <laughs> Howard the Duck? <laughs> <laughs> the Geico goose or whatever, or the Aflac <laughs> <good>. goose. <laughs> All right. So the the only thing, I have one thing to talk about today. That's it. I, okay. That was all the energy that I could muster up. I've had this in the back of my mind a little bit, um, but then I realized that it's a it's a documentary, so there's really no good way for the um, game to work on it, you know? Okay. It's just going to be have to be covered in one of these, so I figured I'd go ahead and bring it up, but, well, I'll just say, I've been wanting to talk about Faces of Death, because uh-huh. that really is... I mean, that's exactly what we're, you know, talking about is those mm-hmm. like weird VHS rentals. And this one was like the first one to show up that was actually banned yes. in 46 countries. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Well, that's what it said on the cover. Right. Whether that where whether it actually was, I, I don't know. I don't think I realized that was 1978. Yeah, exactly. And it shows, you know. In 1978... I don't think I realized there were 46 countries. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or cared. I was two. I, was <laughs> I mean, <seven>. that, <laughs> you know. But anyway, the guys that put those together were, I don't know if they were geniuses or not, but they really hit on something. You know, when I was a kid, I couldn't tell you how many times we rented that. And uh, mm-hmm. also part two and part three 
Part oh, yeah. two has a really cool cover, um, mm-hmm. which is kind of like the uh, skeleton in like scrubs and a and a mask. I think in the back of my head, I pretty much knew, but I didn't confirm it until they did like a, um, you know, finally brought it to DVD. I don't even know if Blu-ray was a thing, you know, when the uh, like 20th anniversary or gosh, okay, I, get it, yeah. I guess it would have been like the think- 30th anniversary, maybe that a lot of the stuff it, you can't say it was fake. It, it's just that the producers um added footage to it. Okay. There were some segments uh that were completely staged. And then there were if you guys don't know, it, it's they make it out to be a documentary, mm-hmm. a very gruesome documentary about just, uh, you know, all the ways, uh, I guess, the different uh, faces of death. But they were kind of stealing from uh, Mondo Kane. Kane? Mm-hmm. Sure. It was put together as kind of like a travel log, like, uh, you know, weird practices from like around the world and stuff. They okay. did a bunch of like Asian and African culture and their, you know, kind of weird uh, traditions and stuff like that, which are sometimes like gruesome. And, you know, they kind of took that idea and just grabbed all of this real footage of like autopsies and suicides and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. kind of uh, supplemented it with, you know, put a... Put a, a spin you, on it? Put a, Well, put kind of like a creepy music and um, like additional footage. Like they would show a real suicide, like a woman jumping off of a building. But then they'd add all of the like people rushing up to the scene and like, you know, cop cars yeah. and all that stuff to kind of give it a little more... You know, just kind of beef it up a little bit. I don't think I've ever looked this up to even know that a lot of this was fake. Well, that's in in, in the commentary when they re-released it on DVD. I think it has both of the uh, producers of the first one and they admitted to all of this stuff, which, ah. you know, and and the most like iconic parts of the movie, the, the little segments that I love the most, which is ghoulish, but... uh are completely fabricated. Like I, lo- <laughs> I, lo- I loved all the fake stuff. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, and it also is kind of like the grandfather of like found footage movies, kind of, you know, yeah. because um, it's got all this like presented like a documentary when really it's like, you know, and Cannibal Holocaust did it too. You know, it's, it's like mm-hmm. a documentary, but it's all, uh, you know, fake. But since this came out though, I mean, this was like, wildly popular and sought it out. cost like nothing to make and made millions of dollars especially when uh you know everybody had a vcr in their house it was mm-hmm. just like always gone from the video store oh yeah was it known then that it was a mockumentary they tried no, to no, no. it as real i think they kept it pretty you know because they didn't want to fuck with the popularity of it i think if i think if mm-hmm. you'd come out to say it was fake then people would be like oh you assholes. Yeah. But it's listed here in, in IMDb as a mockumentary. Right, right, right. And it says here in the trivia that uh, it also contains many deaths that have been proven as staged. Yes. <laughs> I think they kind of did the same thing with like, a, you know, Cannibal Holocaust. I think they got sued and had to actually mm-hmm. prove that some of these people weren't dead. But there's enough real things in it. Like it shows like open heart surgery. It shows it shows autopsies. That's what the whole beginning of the movie is, is they've got kind of a... Uh, you know, like a dollar store uh, in a world guy. We need to stop saying in a world guy. He has a name. I just can't remember it. It's uh, La Fontaine. Yeah, that's right. Maybe that's why is because I don't want to say that out loud. <laughs> I don't remember his first name is like Don, maybe. Yeah, he looks like a Don. But anyway, so they've got, you know, this like that type of voice telling you, you know, telling you that it was real. The very opening of the movie is an autopsy, and um, it's pretty gruesome. I tried to watch the original one this morning, and yeah. I can't do the um, I, I just can't do the animal stuff, which is a right. lot of what you know 
you know, Cannibal Holocaust and the turtle scene and all. We've talked mm-hmm. about all that, but uh, yeah, and all those movies that there was no regard. <laughs> yeah, nobody from PETA was, you know, along with these people. But they were also filmed in, you know, Africa and Singapore and places where shit like that was like, you know, they do. I mean, I don't want to get this wrong, but they do eat like dog and cats. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like not that out of a, out of the blue. But that was the thing is that like I made it to, you know, the monkey scene, which everybody, you know, pretty much knows. Right. <laughs> that it, it looks like they're tourists, basically. And they're at a restaurant and they bring out a little, um, I don't know what type of a rhesus monkey. It's the same monkey in Indiana Jones. I can't, I don't know what those yeah, are called. Sure. Uh, right. spider monkey. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But, uh, one of those little cute guys, they're just filled with rabies. <laughs> Looking back now, it's like, how did I believe that was real? But I mean, when I was a kid, you could not tell me different. Hey, you oh know? man. I still have problems believing it was fake. <laughs> yes. But going back now, so they, they bring this little monkey out. They put his head in a little like it, it's in it's it's like a pillory, but it's sort of like where the umbrella would go if it was like an outdoor table or something. Right. <laughs> yeah. And they kind yeah. of like, you know, pinch the leaves of the table together. So there's just this little cute monkey head uh, popping out of this like, you know, patio table and He's spinning around. I, that I don't think that was on purpose. I, I don't remember that, but he's mm. like walking around <laughs> in a circle, and it looks like you know Linda Blair or something. Like his head is just spinning around. <laughs> um, then they give these two obviously foreigners. You know they're white people. Yes, these little rubber mallets. They kind of play around and bonky bonk the you know, monkey on the head. There's a song about this, oh. but no, that is. <laughs> yeah. It's like a whack-a-mole kind of. Yeah, thing. exactly like whack-a-mole. But, um. Except there's one and there's many people with mouths. <laughs> you cannot miss. <laughs> so, you know, bonk him on the head, cut to them slicing his head open, um, and scooping his brain out, uh, mm-hmm. so they can eat it, you know? Right. That scene that it cuts to, it literally looks like they had like a little monkey doll and mm-hmm. they put like a racquetball in its head and then just kind of cut through the <laughs> racquetball and had a piece of bloody cauliflower, which oddly looks exactly like a brain. <laughs> I watched that on, on YouTube, you know, they were kind of going through the process of that scene and um, uh, it's disgusting. <laughs> and it is. Can you get away with uh, with some of that, knowing that the, your audience is going to be cringing and turning away? Right. Yes. <laughs> like, you know, especially in the early 80s, I guess. They're right. not going to oh, be no. like, you know. But th- granted, like we said, this is 78, was it? Yeah. That was yeah. shocking. And I'm watching it in probably 85, 86 or something, yeah. I, I suppose. And it was so popular even then. Insanely, still insanely. I mean, it was always checked out. Oh yeah. And when you said that Faces of Death was always checked out. Yeah. All right. At, at my video store, I mean, we had a section for all of these movies. We had right. the the traces of death, the faces of yeah. death, and we had all of these things were wildly popular. We could right. rent the fuck out of there them. There were many imitators after that. You know, there was an Asian one called, oh, yeah. uh, what was that one called? Um, Shocking Asia. Yeah, Shocking Asia, which was just a bunch of like, you know, uh, motorcycle wrecks and, you know. Just closed circuit TV. Yeah. yeah. Which now, you know, I mean, you can look at that all day long on the interwebs. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> You don't have to go to the dark web for that. No, I mean, no, it's no. Pretty, uh, it's what's it prevalent. called? Live, live stream or live something? Uh, I've been on there once. It's kind of the new rotten dot com a little bit, where oh, it's okay. just it's like seeing all the contents of a human on the outside, where it's not supposed to be. <laughs> so Don Lafontaine, who was the voice of all the trailers the inner world guy the inner world guy yeah he recorded more than five thousand film trailers five thousand and hundreds of thousands 
of television ad- advertisements, network promotions, and video game trailers. So he's like richer than Bill Gates by this point. Uh, he's a billionaire. Probably. And he's dead. Oh, shit. Yeah. He had nicknames uh, that included Thunderthroat. Ooh. <laughs> I like that. I I tried not to laugh when yeah, I was saying that. But you didn't succeed. Yeah. Thunderthroat, if you say it like that. Does oh that make it God. better? I guess. The voice of God. Yeah. And the king of movie trailers. Well, so. actually, Morgan Freeman is now the voice of God, but. You get a point. That's who everybody hears. That is God. You know, I was saying that kind of, he did actually play God in that whatever movie. Uh, yeah, Bruce Almighty. <laughs> yeah, I forgot. I'm yeah. sorry. That was, I zinged myself. There is a satanic orgy in the middle of Faces of Death. Ooh. Is this the reason I rented it every weekend? Maybe because you see bloody boobies. Mm. There is like a little cannibal scene also staged. And there is, I mean, there's some stuff that, like, 10-year-old me probably should not have been watching. No. (laughs) And now it's all weird and tied up in my head to, like, I mean, I feel pretty normal. I don't know how. I was watching (laughs) shit like this. Ranked number 50 on Entertainment Weekly's top 50 cult films of all time. I think it should have been up there a little higher. Yeah, number 50. Number 50? Oh, it's the very last one. Yes. Uh, I got to see that list now, maybe. See if I agree with it. Circle it. I did. I copy and paste it. Twist it. Bop it. (laughs) Did you see, uh, it says in 1985, a California school teacher forced his class to watch the film. Two of the girls, uh, Diane and Sherry, were so traumatized their parents sued the school. They were awarded (laughs) $100,000. That's he was a math awesome. teacher. I, I read this story earlier. <laughs> was a math yeah. Teacher. What did this have to do? Let let me teach you the art of subtraction. Oh. One less monkey. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't know. He's has to have been arrested by now. <laughs> a math math teacher. <laughs> so funny. Weird. Wild. It says here uh the electrocution scene was was faked, and it was filmed in the attic of a friend's house. Well, so that's another thing that you see that very early on. The guy's eyeballs are taped shut, and I think that is actually something that they used to do. Mm-hmm. But when you watch that scene, it's pretty fucking rad. He starts bleeding from his eyes underneath the the bandages, and kind of foams at the mouth. Uh, yes. I mean, I think that tape is there so your eyeballs don't pop out. I I don't know. Maybe. I just don't think you start leaking blood, but what do I know? But anyway, yeah, uh, yeah, that was fake. I think the part that really hit me the hardest was finding out that the um, Florida sheriff that lassos the alligator, uh, that all that was fake because... No. That was probably my favorite one, my favorite little clip. I don't even remember how How would you lasso. I don't even know how they I put that on film. I don't really understand how lassoing works yeah. in, anyway. Look, that's just, for another just time. Just putting that out there. We're not going to solve that <laughs> riddle. But anyway, he, he ends up in the water in the Everglades with an alligator. And then all, all you see is them rolling this body out that is just it's a body with no arms and no legs i Mm -hmm. I remember and i was just like yeah man i mean that's what you fucking get that was a dumb idea (laughs) and to find out that that was fake was a real slap in the face but (laughs) all this time yeah all this we've been lied to what else is fake the moon landing Uh, Dan Aykroyd, if you're listening, call me. This is why people get so wrapped up in that conspiracy thought and stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. The guy that uh, he's working on, like, plumbing something under the sink and gets, like, bitten a thousand times by uh, cottonmouths or something. And they show his hand and it looks like a... Oh, right. It's just covered in pizza bubbles, sort of, you know, like big, like, bubbly pizza dough is what his hand looks like. (laughs) That's all fake. That's all fake. That's all fake. Yeah. It, basically, everything that you see 
if you think it might be staged, it is. Okay. That's also the thing is like, man, I really, as a kid, thought I was so like savvy about that shit. And when you go back and look at it now, it's like, man, man, that monkey. I was duped. I was completely duped. duped. Maybe I just wanted it to be real so man. much. I was so duped. Man, we got so duped. Oh, I did believe half of this. Yeah, I mean, sure. But You're meant to. maybe if you think about some of the, if they're kind of a reenacted scene, that maybe those were faked. Because the cameras in 78, right. all families did not have a camera. Right. Those are hard to come by. Yeah. And you're also watching this on an old tube TV. And I mean, it just all adds up to, mm-hmm. I mean, that's probably why they had to just come out and say it when they re-released it. Because it's like, now that the film looks so good, there's no <laughs> yeah. way to disguise that that is like, that monkey head is just like made out of like canvas or rubber or something. Mm-hmm. It looks so fake. But the autopsies and stuff, I mean, that is Wrong pretty path. disturbing. I, I don't think I had seen anything like that. You got a point. Now, uh, you know, I have seen and stood and watched an entire procedure uh-huh. of an open heart surgery. Wow. I stood there for five hours and watched the entire thing. It's and, not. And uh, it's fascinating. Yeah. But you weren't, I mean... Oh, I did not have my hands in anything, no. You've got a pretty <laughs> strong constitution. You weren't... You weren't uh, grossed, grossed out or, out or, or feeling faint? Right. No. And I think it's probably because we watch all of these movies. It does desensitize you. We have desensitized ourselves For sure. over the years, yeah. For sure. I feel like... I don't know. I mean, maybe it is just the animal stuff. I have animals. I, I you know, mm. I don't want to see what their brains look like, but... I'm positive most of that stuff was real. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that that's basically what Mondo Connie was, is like mm. a lot of just animal cruelty with a few, you know, beheadings thrown in. Speaking of the beheading, you know, they have yeah. they have people dressed in like kind of vague um, Middle Eastern garb, you know, something wrapped mm-hmm. around their, like a towel wrapped around their head or something. <laughs> I don't mean to say like... <laughs> Maybe that should be edited, but like, you know, looked real enough. Yeah. I, I mean, I bought it. It's odd that there's just this little setting, you know, you can't see anything to the left and right. There's something that looks mm-hmm. like a tent behind them. I mean, you know, it doesn't stand up to like scrutiny, but looked real enough. Thinking about this, though, you wonder that. In today's culture, with the fact that anything and everything can be filmed yeah, and faked, yeah, it might even be a ripe time for more of these type movies to come out. Right. And people would believe that all of it's real because there's probably enough footage out there already. You could just piece it together yourself. Yeah. I want to know if they like re-released Mondo Connie. I need to look at that because that that was a series of movies. You know, that was like four mm-hmm. or five of them. I mean, like I said earlier, that's probably why I like those found footage movies so much because they just seem so much more real. And you know, yeah. you know, like Blair Witch and stuff like that. That's just a extension of this kind of a fake yeah. documentary. Little side note, but we tried to make it through the McPherson tapes last night, Hmm. which is I might have brought it up talking about uh, Blair Witch in the past on this show. Oh, we have a show. Yeah, I just didn't know it was a (laughs) I had to really question myself if it was a show. It is a podcast. We're not showing anyone anything. Oh, uh, I'm showing something right now. You want to guess what it is? Unless you put it on the Patreon, then that's between you and the viewer. (laughs) That's right. Well, how do you spell the McPherson tapes? Or tell me who's in it so I can look it up. No one. Absolutely no one. Okay. I'll type in no one. I don't know if it's the first found footage movie. Where did you watch this? Uh, It's newly released on Shudder. Okay. Uh, but it's from the 80s. It's from the early 80s. And it is a apparent, basically a UFO sighting caught on tape of uh, like a little okay. girl's uh, birthday party that I think, you know, her uncle is filming or, or something, you know. 
And then the power goes out and they hear weird noises and the uncle just keeps on filming. Okay. And they go into the, they kind of hike into the woods and uh, see and hear some weird stuff. But it's just really painfully 80s, you know, and the dialogue that they've kind of because they're just kind of ad libbing or, you know, uh, improvising a little bit. They are doing a good job in that they're trying to sound kind of like douchebaggy guys from the 80s. <laughs> they nailed that. They'd win a Golden Globe <laughs> if they, if that's, you know, it's pretty bad, you know. But it still gives me that same kind of uh, thrill, I guess, you know, that just makes it seem a little more, you know, gritty and not filmed very well. And mm -hmm. so, of course, it's real. I love that stuff. McPherson tapes. I'll have to look it up. Uh, made in 89. God, I, mm, I never that. would have thought that. Okay, McPherson tape. It just says, on a typical fall evening in 1983, a young man was videotaping his niece's fifth birthday party. As the night's strange occurrences took place, he kept his video camera running, recording the entire event. Of the birthday party? Okay. Yeah, that's not a... Uh... Perv. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can stop filming now. We're all in bed. All right. Well, I don't have a ton more to say about Faces of Death. If you okay. want to slide, slide right, right in. in. Yep. Ooh, we both set out at the same time. It's gross. <laughs> <laughs> I was making a few connections, and I tripped over one of our favorite character actors from back in the day. Mm hmm Back in the day, he's still going. Mm -hmm. He's still alive. He may not know it. Uh oh. Talking about M. Emmett Walsh. Oh, love that guy. Love him. Love him. His uh, the M stands for Michael. Okay. In case you want to know, so M. Emmett Walsh. That's a great name, by the way. I was just gonna say, like, I don't know what it is, but if he had been known as, I mean, you know, if he was Michael Walsh. That's not mm -hmm. a good, that's not a great, like, stage name. M. Emmett Walsh yeah. is perfect. Chef's kiss, perfect. Right. His trademarks, chunky, rotund frame. He's a doughy guy. <laughs> Loud, loquacious characters. <laughs> mm -hmm. Often cast seemingly as uh, bellicose but harmless loudmouths. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's pretty. I'm like, wow. That's... I don't know about the harmless part, though. Sometimes he can be kind of... Uh... I mean, he was trying to kill Steve Martin. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he hates these cans. <laughs> now, Blood Simple is what I think about yeah. when I think of him, Emmett Walsh. For sure. He's so good in that. I see. There's not a whole lot of trivia on him, and that's why it makes me wonder if we haven't really gone into detail. His career is awesome. Yeah. I mean, tons. A uh, few things out of his trivia. He was roommates in college with William Devane. Okay, great. Another guy we need to oh talk about. Oh, my God. Those two guys together? Forget about mm -hmm. it. He's been deaf in his left ear since he was three years old. Did Mr. So. Gower punch him in his bad ear? M.M. <laughs> <laughs> M. at Walsh, uh, born in 1935, has 230 credits. Good Lord. To his books. That is a lot. And the jerk, he was simply madman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his thing was he just picked names out of the phone book. And if I'm remembering that, I haven't seen the jerk in a long time. Is that what he did? Yep, I think so. Is that how Steve Martin was finally somebody? He was in the phone book yes. and then gets yes, and then targeted immediately. by Emmett Walsh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think that's how it worked. A.M. Emmett Walsh uh, started his career in 1968, but he was in 1969's Midnight Cowboy, yeah. uncredited. Uncredited. Hmm. Never seen that movie, and I'm, I don't know oh, if I want to see I don't, it. I think I tried watching it not too long ago, and I, I just, you know, for whatever reason, I, I couldn't make it through it. I don't know if it was the pacing of it or something, but. So, yeah, some of these older films that were, well, probably very popular back in the day, I, I just, I can't get into. Uh, he was in 1969 Stiletto. Don't know that one. A rich jet-setting playboy has a secret life. He's a professional hitman for the mob. <laughs> Wackiness ensues. When he decides it's time to retire, 
he finds his former employers don't like the idea of somebody who knows too much not being under their control anymore, and they decide to eliminate him. Makes sense to me. Tale as old as time. Um, Alex Cord. Who is Alex Cord? We've talked about him. Uh, okay, I gotta get back. He was an airwolf. Oh, he was in Chosen Survivors. That was that bat movie. <laughs> yes. Post-apocalyptic bat movie. Yeah. There's three guys with a mustache. This guy is one of them. D. Wallace's husband. <laughs> I wasn't even thinking about him. That's another good mustache. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking of, um, oh, my God. Oh, my mind is a piece of shit. That's going on my ringtone. <laughs> Sam Elliott. Jesus. Okay, so there's Sam Elliott. There's Alex Cord. And there's the guy that played um, the the cop with the horse. Um, why? <laughs> why is my mind <laughs> is just broken? Uh, the cop with the horse. Edit all of this out. Stiletto also has uh, Britt Eklund. Yep. We've talked about her. British. She was a Bond girl, right? Yeah. yeah. And she was in The Wicker Man. That's what it was. Ah, uh, yeah. king of the wicker people. It also has Roy Scheider and Lincoln Kilpatrick. Uh, M. Emmett Walsh was also in Alice's Restaurant. Yeah. I've maybe seen that once before. I've seen it one time. Uh, M. Emmett Walsh was in Escape from the Planet of the Apes. And he was not an ape. Wow. I mean, immediately I was like, oh, well, he was an ape, obviously. <laughs> it says he was aid. I'm not looking it up. Man, we need to... Have you ever seen the other, the, the sequels to that? Uh, yes. All I remember is, I think it's Beneath the Planet of the Apes, where they're worshipping the bomb and... Yeah, I remember that one the most. Yeah. Yeah. That was a good, like, Sunday afternoon movie, you know? He was in Slapshot. Yeah. He was in Airport 77. Oh, man. We already said the jerk. He was in Brubaker. <laughs> I like the way you said that. He played C.P. Woody Woodward. Is he making fun of his own name at this point? Maybe so. It's like my name so. is kind of silly too. Um, he was in Ordinary People as uh, the swim coach. And wasn't uh, this movie about a family whose son died by drowning? Yikes. I, <laughs> I don't know. If I am going to a pool and M. Emmett Walsh is... The lifeguard, I I don't know if I'm going to be swimming around in that pool. It looks like he'd just be up there like eating a sandwich or something and letting me drown. So uh, he was also in Cannery Row. Never seen it. That is one of my I'm mother's favorite movies. I've never seen it either. But he played Bryant in 1982 Blade Runner. Oh, man. He's basically the same character from Blood Simple, you know? Yeah. He's just like a rumpled like detective right yeah rumpled he was hot in the 80s he was in silkwood yeah i'm glad that we didn't see him getting like a silkwood shower you know just like Ooh. scrubbing him with the <laughs> giant brush as he's telling them where to go to get the get the good spot come on yeah get in there you gotta get in there deep kid. <laughs> oh no <laughs> All right, 86 was like everything is coming up, M. Emmett Walsh. But I want to talk about Scandalous, 1984. 84. This was uh, Rob and Larry Cohen. This had Robert Hayes, John Gilgood, M. Emmett Walsh. Well, I for sure remember the box art, but no, I, I, I don't think I've ever seen it. An investigative reporter following an espionage story goes to London oh and gets involved with a murder, a scam artist, and rock concerts. Okay. All right. I need you to go to picture number 10 okay. <laughs> immediately, as fast as your fingers will allow. Okay. Is this Robert Hayes looking like he just shit his pants? Go, keep Am going. I the wrong pick. Oh, that's number 11. No, <laughs> hey, that's John Gilgood in leather. <laughs> it looks like he's in uh, cruising with Al Pacino. Yeah, he's got his ear pierced. <laughs> it's just John Gilgood, though, still. Yes. He's got a button on his jacket there. Yeah. It really looks like Alice Cooper. Oh, man. 
<laughs> Probably. Or Pat Benatar. Either one of those would be. <laughs> yeah, a good bit. <laughs> Interesting. I've never seen Robert Hayes in a serious movie, although I guess this might not be that it, serious. It says comedy mystery. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Might have to see this. Oh. Picture number two, you get to see John Gilgood with the leather pants on as well. Nah, I'm not going <laughs> to. Oh. I've already. <laughs> not fallen for that one? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, M. M. at Walsh, uh, you were saying back in 86 then. Yeah, 86 is like primo Walsh mm -hmm. or M. M. The best of times, Wildcats, Critters, man. I mean. Back to school, remember? Oh, he was the coach in Back to School. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> you got to do the triple win. Oh, <laughs> my God. I just think about the slow motion scenes of Rodney Dangerfield just <laughs> bouncing and like mugging for the camera. I loved it. I have seen that movie too many yeah, times. Yeah. Yep. Yep. He calls Robert Downey Jr. the poster child for abortion. Yeah, he does. <laughs> he truly does. Does he say abortion or does he say birth control? Oh, or maybe it's birth control. I feel like that would be. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, too uh, much. Too far. Too much. So as you were talking about raising Arizona, yeah, Harry man. and Henderson's. Oh look, the Milagro Beanfield Lord. Oh, no, it's everywhere. <laughs> His IMDb is making me feel like we've like you know stumbled onto something here. Did you know that Robert Redford directed the Milagro Beanfield Lord? That sounds about right. Why is that rated R? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway. It sounds utterly boring. No beans were harmed during the filming of this movie. <laughs> That's it. Man, he's been so busy. Time to kill. Sundown the vampire in retreat. So I'm talking about vampires. I'm going to talk to another vampire here in a second. Just we can talk about more and more about his career. But I want to go back down here near the bottom. And we're going to talk about a movie in 1971 called They Might Be Giants. Yeah, I saw that. They Might Be Giants has George C. Scott, Jack Guilford, who plays Gog in Caveman. Okay, sure. Or no, no, he or he was Bernie. Ah, uh, he was Bernie in Cocoon. Right, right, right. Which one was he? Caveman or Cocoon? He was... Cocoon. He is Bernie in Cocoon. Yeah, Cocoon. I had, I had it right the second time. Cocoon. Bernie Lefkowitz. He was the one that was scared to... Yes. And he should have been scared. Yeah. As Al Lewis, who played Grandpa in The Munsters, sure. right? Yep. Uh, Rue McClanahan. Oh, classic Rue. Scroll down a little bit further. F. Murray Abraham. Boom. And now I declare myself the winner of the podcast. Yes, you did it. <laughs> you got all the pieces. F. Murray Abraham, M. Emmett Walsh, and George C. Scott. That was like blackout bingo. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> In the same movie. So much face. Oh, my God. Never seen it. If you stitched all of those faces together, it would wrap around the world twice. Yes. <laughs> so, They Might Be Giants reads, In a Manhattan psychiatric hospital, a man, convinced that he is Sherlock Holmes, is treated by a female doctor who happens to be named Watson. Ooh. How many female that, doctor jokes do you think there were in that movie? <laughs> well, it is rated G, so probably not as many as we wanted. At least one person <laughs> said, I have an appointment with your father. You know what I'm, that old thing, you know? <laughs> yep, that one. You couldn't possibly be somebody that can help me. <laughs> exactly, stupid woman. <laughs> So, M. Emmett Walsh, I just wanted to talk about him briefly and say thank you for your entire film history. Man, I mean, it, it really does just like you could spend a while just looking at his credits. But it's time to start wrapping up this podcast. God, we're in the weeds. And these are the ones that are supposed to be short. Can't stop talking. Our opening was 30 minutes long. Yeah. And what did we say? Barely anything. I don't even remember. I think I've lost time. <laughs> All right. So let's get this yarn taken care okay. of. What do you say? Yep. Let's do it right now. All right. Right the fuck now. No fucking around. <laughs> Start off at Phantasm. Phantasm 2. We've already talked about son of a bitch. Did you lose it? We're going to Phantasm 1. <laughs> oh, my God. Pick a Phantasm. 
Nah, pick a phantasm. Well, hell, it's almost the same character. That's why I got confused. As Father Meyer character in part two gets the spear to the head and gets his brain sucked yep. out. Right. Yep. Kenneth V. Jones as the caretaker in Phantasm One gets the same thing happen. Sure. He is the pinnacle uh brain splatter. Yeah. Uh, his makeup was absolutely atrocious, by the way, because I thought he was an undead at one point. Yeah. He had to have stolen that wig from Angus Grimm, put it on his head. He did have a weird, like, Amish look to him. Yeah. <laughs> He's an Amish caretaker. He has very little to his filmography. Yeah. He has three credits. Three credits. They are all Don Coscarelli's movies, I think. So we got Kenny and Company as Mr. Soupy. <laughs> Okay. Phantasm as the caretaker. And in 1993, he was in a movie called Hidden Fears. Meg Foster. Meg Foster. We're going to pick her up. Okay. Okay. Put her back down. Put her back. (laughs) She's heavy. No, pick her back up. She's light. Yeah. You got to love Meg because we did see her at Texas Frightmare. Yeah. She's great. She's great. We love her. We can go down to her career and talk about her for, for hours. The biggest films we remember has uh, They Live. Yeah, that's the big one. That's the big yeah, one for you? I think so, yeah. She was in... Um, Cagney and Lacey. She was in Best of the Best Part 2. <laughs> yes. She was in Cagney and Lacey, and in her trivia, you'll see that she actually played Cagney for six episodes, and they replaced her. Oh, wow. And I'll read directly out of her trivia once I get there was replaced by Sharon Gless on Cagney and Lacey after six episodes. CBS reported that they wanted somebody more feminine. She is very, like, android-looking. I mean, some of it's the eyes, but some of it's I also... I think most of it is the eyes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize that Jeepers Creepers 3 was so recent. I've never seen that. She's like the lead, and she's a little off. She plays it real well. The script just sucks ass. Gotcha. Something I didn't know? Married to Stephen McHattie from 1976 to question mark. I need to see their kids immediately (laughs) to see what the hell they look like. What I'm imagining is not good. Lance Henriksen (laughs) as a baby with crazy eyes. (laughs) Beautiful. Wow, I didn't know that. She came around in the 80s and did a lot of different films that I remember her as. And mostly I remember her from Stepfather Part 2. Okay. She was the love interest. Gotcha. But in 1980, she was in Carney. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Yep. We've talked about Carney plenty of times. I almost no reason, decided but... we needed to watch this film, but I talked myself out oh. of it. So you're welcome. Yeah. Gary Busey, Jodie Foster, Meg Foster, not related. Crazy. And Tim Thomerson shows up right there. Uh, Craig Wasson's down there. And Burt Remsen, who played Grandpa in our second movie that we did. Remsen. Remsen. Why does that sound like a fake name? Every time I say it, you say the same exact thing. Oh, yeah. He played Grandpa in Terror Vision. Oh, right, right, right. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. Although he's much beefier. He was actually looked a little like he was in shape in Terror Vision. God, that seems like a long time ago. It was a long time ago. Guys, don't go back and listen to that episode. Oh, we really sucked back then. We were drunk. Uh, we've come a long ways. I would say start with our most recent and then work your yeah, way back. work your way back. When it starts getting bad, just turn this off. Yeah. Start over from the latest one and go back again. Yes. Just a little trivia. Burt Remsen was also in Sundown, A Vampire in Retreat with M. Emmett Walsh. Is that what we're doing next? No. Okay, good. But I was looking at Carney. I talked myself out of that. We're not going with Carney. I looked at the Osterman weekend because mm-hmm. I thought I remembered that because the box is iconic. It always mm-hmm. saw it at the video store. <laughs> I think you said iconic, which is iconic. like <laughs> <laughs> it's a movie that has to do with a carny or iconic. Do you remember? Have you ever seen the Osterman weekend? 
Is it like a like hunting trip gone wrong, murder cover up, or what the hell is the story? That's what it looks like on the box. Yeah. But Boy, that's not really what happens in the movie. I I couldn't tell you. This has Rutger Hauer, John Hurt, Craig T. Nelson, Dennis Hopper, Chris Sarandon, Meg Foster, Whoa. Helen Shaver, Burt Lancaster. <laughs> it's like, holy shit. Ton of people. Ton of people. And it looks like that John Hurt was trying to convince that three of Rutger Hauer's friends are like Russian spies. Okay. So he's trying to get them together, but it's also like a conspiracy. Are they really spies? Are they fucking with them? I don't know. I haven't seen the movie. Oh, it does not look familiar after watching the trailer. It's directed by Sam Peckinpah from a yes. Robert Ludlum novel. So, yeah, it's all secret spy stuff. Yeah. Now I want to watch it. Yeah, I'm interested. I almost picked this as our movie, but then I, I moved on. So, from Osterman Weekend, we're picking up Chris Sarandon, because we love oh, Chris Sarandon. Man. Where I wanted to talk about vampires. Yeah. All right? Yeah. Chris Sarandon, we love him. Mm -hmm. I scrolled down to something I didn't ever see him in before. He played the creature in a 1986 version TV movie of Frankenstein. Oh, I I know right. I've looked at this before, but wow, that's crazy. There's not even a photo of the movie. <laughs> if you look at Chris Sarandon out of all the like universal monsters, you, Frankenstein doesn't immediately jump to mind. Dracula, no. maybe. Yeah, he played a vampire and he fits that this looks like it's it was listed as a uh a family movie oh, okay it's a family horror sci-fi i tried to look up a trailer for it and this is right before we started the show so i only found one little bit that wasn't necessarily a trailer but had frankenstein's monster wrapped up like the mummy and had electrodes hooked to his ankles and his neck, right? Okay. It looked very, very cheap. And the guy who plays uh, Victor Frankenstein, who was Carl Beck, absolutely nobody I've heard of, has doesn't even have a picture on his IMDb profile. He cut away the, the wrapping around the creature's face, and it is a horribly cheap mask. Okay. And if that's Chris Sarandon in that mask, I've got to laugh so hard because he's just doing the the groaning kind of, you know, ooh, fire bad. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Go out and watch this. That's crazy. Maybe the that little piece that I watched, I think it was in Spanish or maybe even Italian. I couldn't make out any words, but it made it even more comical. Wow. Very strange. That is very weird. I just realized that he is Al Pacino's boyfriend in Dog Day Afternoon. Oh, really? I've <laughs> never, I did not, I mean, it doesn't look like him. He's very young. Awesome. That's wild. He's got to be young. Well, besides uh, The Princess Bride and Fright Night, Child's mm -hmm. Play. Man. I did not know that there was a video game of Fright Night. What? And Chris Sarandon played the voice of his returning character, Jerry Dandridge. It looks like it's an 8-bit side-scrolling. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, like for maybe the NES. Yeah. I want to play this. Oh, I'm looking at it right now. It's on the Amiga. I see it there. It was the Amiga. Somebody please find this for us. Why don't we have the oh. main version? I think I might have it already. I All will right. definitely let you know. All right. Play that. Loop it. It looks great. <laughs> it looks freaking great. Please, if somebody wants to take us and turn us into 8-bit, I'll go for Please. that. Please. We will start doing video if you could just turn me into an 8-bit character. Yeah, and then upload I... us into the game. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've been watching a lot of Westworld, so. Also know that uh, Chris Sarandon obviously plays Jack Skellington's voice in The Nightmare Before Christmas. Yes. That's probably his, his biggest role. And I know we've talked about him in length before that, uh, yes, he was married to Susan Sarandon for 13 years back in the 60s, uh, late 60s, early 70s. 
whatever. Yeah. Hmm. Anyway. All right. So we're picking up Chris Sarandon and we're going to next week's movie that I'm surprised you didn't mention before. And I made you skip past it. 1977. We're going to watch The Sentinel. Yes. I really, I thought briefly you were going to talk about Fright Night. And I was like, no, Tim, no. But yes, The Sentinel is perfect. You have seen this just recently, haven't you? Halloween last year, I think we watched it. So okay. yeah, within the last few months. Uh, Yeah, dude. Michael Winner. Directs it. And he wrote the screenplay. Yes. And it's another one that just has a cavalcade of... 70s and 80s people. Or so many people. 60s and 50s, I guess. Jerry Orbach, Eli Wallach. Mm. Yeah, Christopher Walken, Beverly D'Angelo. Oh, my God. Beverly D'Angelo is crazy in this. John Carradine, Jose Ferrer, Martin Balsam. Martin Balsam. You might know him Rudy. as... <laughs> <laughs> you might know him as... Uh, oh, damn it. What's his name? You're a lousy butler. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a good voice. Uh, James Arthur Cummings. Mr. Cummings. <laughs> Tom Berenger is also in The Sentinel. He plays Man at End. We'll have to look for him. <laughs> oh, wow. See, I don't, even, I don't even remember that. Yeah, this is a good one. This movie simply reads off of IMDb, a young woman moves into an apartment building in which houses a sinister evil. That's it. Boom. That's what you got. I mean, what else do you want? Oh, man. John Carradine's eyes are in probably the coolest uh, box art for this movie. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, right there. Would that be photo number five? Yes, that's John Carradine. Probably doesn't awesome. even know where he's at. Nope. I had to wheel him on to these movies. <laughs> William Hickey is in it. Oh, uh, love William Hickey. With a full wig of red hair. I might watch this tonight, Tim. I love this. Awesome. I mean, you know, Satan and everything, but that's, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know? Oh, my God. Jerry Orbach with a serial molester mustache. <laughs> Perfect. So, all right, guys. I did not look to see where you can watch this, but it says here... Tubi. Guys, find out what Tubi is and then download it. Yeah. I watch movies on Tubi all the time. Do you really? Yeah. Okay. Well. Oh, dude. For some reason, did I get drunk the other night and uh, actually told YouTube to put in my watch later an episode of That's Incredible from 1981? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I, I can't imagine. No, oh, probably did. Yeah, to be for free, Amazon wants four bucks to watch it, which is, you know. Yeah, it looks like you can also buy or rent it on YouTube as well. To be for free, it is. Yeah, to be, dude. <laughs> totally to be. All right, Jason, let's go ahead and wrap up this episode. What do you say? Okay, damn it. Damn it. Tell everybody where they can find us. Go to the moratorium.com. There. You a holes. Now. <laughs> right now. Do it now. Oh, what are you waiting for? You can visit your grandma in hospice later. <laughs> oh, God. I don't know. That was probably. Uh, show her, too. She might like it. Yeah. Yeah, we're watching 70s movies. She probably remembers them. Satanic 70s. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. I for sure am watching it tonight. I'm excited. Awesome. All right. Well, you can also find us on all the social medias. Check us out on our Facebook Facebook groups. Our group is still growing. We're almost, uh, we've gained quite a bit of followers. Now, if I can just get you guys to listen to the show. Yeah, that would be great. I shouldn't say that since the ones that are actually hearing me say listen to the show are the ones listening to the show. Yeah, that's a weird, I don't know. I don't know how things work anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. <laughs> things are hard. Check us out on Twitter, on Instagram, mm -hmm. and Tender. also, like you said, Everything you can find is on the moratorium.com. Krista's blog post is going strong. She's already working on another one that has a uh, murder that happened uh, not too far away from our hometown here in Oklahoma. 
Ooh. Tulsa, Oklahoma. Scary. Anyway, I'm looking forward to what she produces, but go on out and check her out only on the moratorium. You can find her blog. It's like 12 pages long or even more after I put some pictures in there. Unbelievable. About the smiley face killer. You should check it out. Awesome. Anyway, go check it out. She's just like us, only in print form that she can't stop talking about something once she gets started. So right. blog post, short story, whatever you want to call it. If you'd like to support us, go to our Patreon and just for as little as a Please. dollar a month, you can help support this podcast. We don't ask for much. Hey, if you got a connection to uh, Lloyd Kaufman, hey, hey, <sighs> tell him to call me. If you want to give us a couple of more dollars, you can get our extension extended director's cuts of our movie episodes straight to your ear holes. Wow. I cut over 30 minutes out of a lot of our podcasts. You should really tune in and hear what we cut out. Yeah. It's unbelievable. As we intended them to be listened to. Right. I always leave the stuff in. You tell me to edit out. I usually leave it in. You do? It's that stuff you're like, dude, that's good. Oh, you should leave that one in. That's what I usually cut out. Oh, my God. That seems like a weird way to do that. I know. I do the exact opposite. <laughs> wow. Interesting. I'm going to have to listen to this podcast. Moratorium, you, you said? Yeah. Yeah. You can find it at uh, themoratorium.com. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. It's a website you own. <laughs> I'll probably check it out later. <laughs> All right. All right, guys, let's shut this bitch down. Jason, got anything else to say about Phantasm? No. Oh. Until we Damn. talk about it later. Damn, boy. <laughs> Ooh, good one. All right, guys. All right, folks. Bye. Good night. You've been listening to The Yarn Wall, an M.T. Cornfield production. Tune in next week when we talk about the awkwardness of watching your neighbor masturbate in The Sentinel. Yeah, you heard me right. I'm sure if you wanted to see that scene, you could watch it on YouTube on a two-hour loop. Until then, you can tune in next week and listen to us rant about it for conservatively 20 minutes. If you have any movie suggestions or just want to tell us how much we really suck, you can contact us at moviemoratorium at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and long live VHS. What else is fake? The moon landing? Uh, Dan Aykroyd, if you're listening, call me.